Excellent. So the second uh, second talk of this session of, of, of the Group Craft 2 conference is uh, Andre Carvalho, who's talking about dynamics of endomorphisms of free abelian times free groups. Okay. Oh, so thank you. Uh, or the, I want to thank the organizers for, for putting together this, this nice conference and for inviting me, of course. Um, and yeah, as Alan said, I will um, speak about dynamics of endomorphisms of free view and times free groups. And I would like to start by defining some pretty standard notions in dynamical systems, but not so uh, common in, uh, in group theory. So I will just define everything uh, and try to be as clear as, as possible. Um, so if we have a, a continuous mapping of a metric space M, uh, the omega limit of a point Y in the metric space is uh, the set of accumulation points of this sequence F to the N of Y. So you have uh, the point Y and you have, and you apply F and F of Y and then F, F of Y and so on and so on and so on. And <clears throat> you take the set of accumulation points of this, of this sequence. So, um, for example, if your metric space is, is compact, this will always be non-empty because it will have some convergent subsequence. Um, and this is a, an important case of, of, of what we are uh, doing. Uh, and also in the case of a compact space, uh, if your uh, mapping is a homeomorphism, then uh, it's equivalent to have a finite omega limit and it's the omega limit being a periodic orbit. Of, and the, the size of the omega limit is the size of the orbit, of course, because if you have a periodic point, say x, then obviously you can find uh, constant subsequences of the orbit of x uh, for each point of the of the orbit, and you cannot find a, a conversion subsequence to any other point. So this is. Um, uh, obvious that a periodic point must have uh, the omega limit of a periodic point must be its periodic orbit. And in the case where this happens for every point, so every point has a finite omega limit and it is a periodic orbit, we say that this uh, dynamics of the system is asymptotically periodic. And this is well, this is a quite an important notion in dynamical systems because it, it gives you some 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 grasp of the long term behavior of the of the system because you know uh, which points you are going to be close uh, if you take it the, the, the time to, to infinity. So, and which points you lose because you don't uh, approximate anymore. And if you, every point you approximate uh, in the long term is periodic, you say that the dynamics is asymptotically periodic. So I have two more notions, uh, dynamical also, uh, which is the notion of a recurrent point. So you have, again, a metric space and a continuous mapping, and you say that a point is recurrent if uh, for every neighborhood of the point, you always get inside the neighborhood. Uh, the orbit of the point always gets inside of the neighborhood. So uh, you have a point, you, the orbit of the point might leave the neighborhood, but every neighborhood you take, you will always get inside the neighborhood. And this is clearly the same thing as saying that x belongs to the omega limit of x, because you can find the convergence of sequence to going to x. So the point is recurrent if and only if it belongs to its own omega limit. And a point is said to be wandering if uh, there is a neighborhood of the point, um, and such that from some point on, so there is a positive integer such that from that point on, uh, take this neighborhood u, then f to the n of u does not intersect u, which means that uh, from some point on, the orbit of x will not be inside u, but actually the orbit of any of all these points will be outside u okay, from some point on. So you might uh, get inside again, but you leave and at some point you leave and never come back. So all well, this notation, this terminology, I don't think it is uh, probably the best because you can have, for example, an isolated point uh, going to a fixed point uh, 
And these two points will be wandering because you can take this to be your neighborhood, just the point X. And you take, uh, so Fn of X will, not, will never be in the neighborhood because it's different from X. And the point will be called wandering, but it's not moving uh, because it's in a, the orbit goes to a fixed point and it, it never leaves. So wandering doesn't really mean that it's always moving, it just, leaves, it just means that it, it leaves some neighborhood and doesn't come back. Uh, well, you, it, these implications are easy. So if you have a periodic point, then it's obviously recurrent because you can find a convergent subsequence of the orbit. So say if the period is P, you get X, uh, sorry, F to the P, K, K of X. This will be when K goes to infinity. This will be a subsequence constant, which is always X. And so X belongs to its own omega limit. And if the point is recurrent, you can also see that it's, it's not wandering. It's, it's uh, obvious because every neighborhood you take, uh, you will all, the orbit of X will always be inside the neighborhood. So you cannot make it leave the neighborhood forever. But the converse uh, implications, they do not hold in general. Uh, and the, probably the easiest examples are, uh, if you have a, an irrational rotation of the circle, uh, you will get something dense. And so you will approximate the point arbitrarily, but it will not be periodic. And also in the circle, so, so this, this is not happening because you will be a recurrent point, but not periodic. And to prove that this does not happen, you can also take a circle and you take, for example, the mapping that um, well, given alpha maps uh, to, to alpha. And this point here will be sent to here and it will never leave this because this will be a fixed point. Uh, so this point is not recurrent, but it's also um, not wandering because if you take any arc containing the point, uh, say u, f n of u will double the size every time you apply and it will eventually cover the entire circle. And so it will intersect u. So you can have non-wandering, not recurrent. You can have uh, recurrent, not periodic, uh, but you cannot have the, the other way around. So I want to just say uh, some things about older mappings. Uh, mappings have to be holder if there are some constants K and R positive, such that the distance of the images of X and Y is bounded above by K times the distance of X and Y to the R. And Obviously, if you apply this uh, uh, again and again and again, you get this inequality depending on n on the iterations of the images. And one thing that you can prove is that if you have a metric space and holder mapping, then every non-wandering point is recurrent. So the second implication also you, you get the converse if your mapping is holder. And this is uh, very easy to see. So you just take any non-wandering point which means that uh, for every neighborhood you take, you get arbitrarily large integers uh, such that the image of the neighborhood intersects the neighborhood. So for arbitrarily large n's, you get y n's that uh, whose orbit gets inside the neighborhood after n steps. So you take for every epsilon, you get that there are arbitrarily large n's such that yn is closed at the distance bounded by epsilon and yn phi to the n is also at the distance bounded above by epsilon from x. Uh, so if you take a small epsilon, say smaller than this, uh, then x phi to the n and yn phi to the n will have their distance bounded above by this expression because it's older. And this part here is bounded by epsilon because yn is in the neighborhood, but also the distance of yn uh, phi to the n for x is bounded above by epsilon because we are taking this uh, yn that gets inside the neighborhood after n steps. 
And so we just apply the triangular inequality and you get, and you do the calculations and everything works fine. And you get that X pi to the N is close to X for arbitrarily large Ns. And that is the definition of being recurrent. So you have, if you take a very small epsilon, you get arbitrarily large integers such that X pi to the N is close to X. And so the point is recurrent. So one of the implicate one of the converse implications is done, and we want to study also what can happen in the other one. And now we are going to groups, which is uh, nice. And we will start with the simplest example, I think, it, which is the, the free group. Uh, the prefix metric you can define on a free group is given by, uh, well, the distance between two words is zero if the words are the same, obviously. And if the words are different, uh, you say that the distance is two to the minus uh, the longest common prefix between u and v. So you have u, you have v, and this longest common prefix will be denoted by this. And you say that words are close if they share a, a long prefix. Uh, and well, they are apart if they do not. And this is an example of a visual metric. It's uh, very used. And so the, when you do the completion of this space, you get uh, the gram of completion. And what we will do is studying endomorphisms uh, whenever we can extend it to the completion and study that this mapping on the completion, which is a compact space, which is a lot nicer than uh, we get if we do not extend. And you can extend it if and only if it is uniformly continuous. So if, if it is uniformly continuous, then you can extend generally in, in a metric space. Uh, but since we have a compact space, then extending continuously means extending uniformly continuous. And so this, these conditions are equivalent, being able to extend the continuous mapping of the completions and being uniformly continuous. And in the case of the free group, this just means that the mapping is, uh, the endomorphism is injective or uh, trivial. And this has been done with the visual metrics for hyperbolic groups, for virtually free groups, um, and for some other metrics for direct products, which we will in part see today. Uh, and yeah, sometimes it's nicer to study the, the, the extension and then get properties of the original by uh, then getting it uh, directly. But one good thing is that uniformly continuous in the morphisms of free groups and even more generally of hyperbolic groups are in fact older. And so this is nice because the second implication, we, we get the converse uh, for free just using the fact that it's older. And moreover, yeah, the, the continuous extension to the completion is also older and with the same constants. This is a uh, result by uh, Araujo and Silva should be here. Um, yeah, these extensions also satisfy all the conditions. So we get this, this converse implication, which is this. So if you have a uniformly continuous in the morphism of a free group and you take uh, endow the groups with the prefix metric, you take its unique continuous extension to the completion and you get that every non-wandering point is recurrent. So there is this, uh, theorem by Levitt and Lustig that say that if you have an automorphism of the free group, then the dynamics is asymptotically periodics. Uh, but this means that if you take a recurrent point, uh, then X belongs to the omega limit of X. And if the dynamics is asymptotically periodics, then the omega limit of X is a periodic orbit. So you get that X is in fact periodic. So this means that for automorphisms, uh, recurrent points are periodic. And so for automorphisms, we get that all these things are equivalent. And I shouldn't, it's probably worth noticing that this equivalence here, so periodic equivalent to non-wandering is in fact a more general statement of this theorem because um, points belonging to omega limits cannot be wandering. And so what we're saying is that if you take any, any point, uh, you take its omega limit, which is non-empty, and it's made of non-wandering points, then it's necessarily made of periodic points. Uh, and so this gives you a more general statement to this Levitin-Lustig's theorem, but 
obviously the hard part, the hard work is, is done by proving that this implication holds, which is 100% given by the, the theorem. So, but yeah, it's a more general statement. Even the proof is basically the same. You just have to prove that you have this thing uh, given by a holder. And one thing that I would like to know is, and I believe it's can be true, but I, I still haven't uh, attempted it uh, very hard, is that if you can get this for endomorphisms, uh, uniformly continuous endomorphisms. So this thing works. So it's, this part would have to be checked if uh, we can get a similar thing as the one obtained by Levit and Lustig, but for endomorphisms. Uh, I had just tried a few things and uh, it was it didn't look so easy, but I, I need to think a little bit more about it. So if you have any ideas or know how to do it, I would be very glad to, to hear it. Uh, yeah, and now we're going to move to the free bigon times free groups, which is the uh, what we try to do. So try to obtain the same or same kind of results, but for these, these groups. And the first thing that we needed to do was to uh, endow the group with some metric that made sense. And we, well, this is uh, a direct product of three groups. So we just endow each group with the prefix metric, which in the case of Z is just, well, this is between two numbers is well, zero if equals Q. It is one if the signs are different uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, because, uh, yeah, they don't share a prefix. Uh, and it is two to the minus the minimum of the absolute value of Q and P, Q and P if uh, the signs are the same. Yeah, um, because now the prefix is just the minimum of the absolute value. So we're we are thinking of Z as uh, some thing, some letter, uh, uh, some other uh, words in some, in some, the alphabet with one letter. And we take the completion of this metric space uh, with the product metric, taking the prefix metric in each component. And I will just say this, if for the case, uh, any of you know what this means, I will not get into too much details, but into many details, but uh, this is uh, some nice result that if, if you know what these concepts are that you might uh, like, is that uh, uniformly continuous endomorphisms for this metric are uh, precisely the coarse median preserving in the morphisms for the natural coarse median to take in this space. So if you take the coarse median uh, given by a probabilicity uh, and the natural one in Z, which is just a numeric median, you take the product coarse median, then the endomorphisms that preserve this coarse median uh, are precisely the uniformly continuous endomorphisms. But I, I do not have time to uh, define everything here, but if, in case you know what this is, well, this is this is true, and it might be nice. Uh, but now we're going to see really what we get. So these endomorphisms were classified by Delgado and Ventura, um, and they they divided them in in two different types. So the, the type one endomorphisms, you have something of this kind. You have a u where a is uh, just a vector, and u is uh, word in the free group and the, your image will be well you will be affected by an endomorphism of the free group a will be affected by an endomorphism of zm so multiply by matrix but then you add something here which is the abelianization of u times a matrix and uh, in the type 2 case you get the same thing in the first component but in the second component you get something uh, you get always powers of the same word Z and the exponent is affected by A and U, but um, the second component is, uh, you always get powers of the same word Z. And well, 
type two endomorphisms are many times easier, but I've come across some problems where they are harder to deal with. So yeah, it's uh, in this case, it will be a bit harder, but uh, yeah, we, we, we worked some things out. Uh, so the first thing we saw was which endomorphisms are uniformly continuous. And for type one, and the morphisms, uh, you get that, well, this P must be zero. And so you just get two endomorphisms, one applied in each component. Um, and each of them must be uniformly continuous. So Q must be uniformly continuous and phi must be uniformly continuous, which means phi is trivial or injective, or and Q has at most one non zero uh, entry in each column. Okay, so you. It can a column can be made of entirely of zeros or it will have at most one non-zero entry. And well, since we have our endomorphisms are just products of endomorphisms in each component, then obvious, obviously, uh, if a U is periodic, then U must be periodic. Because if uh, well, a Q to the N, U phi to the N is a U, then U phi to the N is a U. But the nice thing is that if you demand your Q to be invertible, then the converse also holds because you get uh, a matrix where as a, that has at most one on zero entry in each column and it has determinant one or minus one. So it's a signed permutation matrix, which has finite order. And so every point is periodic. So if you demand your matrix to be invertible, uh, AU being periodic is the same thing as U being periodic. And you can also see that if U is wandering, that's enough to make AU wandering. Because, well, so if you have you wandering, you have some neighborhood here such that you will never get back inside the neighborhood. And if you take, uh, so from you have n such that from n greater than n, you will not, never get back inside the neighborhood. And if you have a u and you take the same epsilon and the same n, and you take n greater than n, then if you have, if you ever get inside the neighborhood again, if some point here bv is such that bq to the n, b phi to the n is inside the neighborhood, then this v would appear here. And since you're taking the product metric, then v phi to the n will also appear here and you would get this contradiction. So you being wandering is enough to make a u wandering. And so you get really the same result that we got for free group because well, uh, if you take a, sorry, uh, yeah, if you take a, a, no, it's better this way. Yeah. If you take a, a non wandering point, so a u non wandering will mean that u is non wandering because, uh, yeah, u being wandering is enough to make a, a u wandering. But if you are in an automorphism, uh, then you get that non wandering points are periodic, so u is periodic. And if you are in an automorphism, your Q is invertible. And so U being periodic is enough to make a U periodic. And so in, again, in case of automorphisms, you get that uh, non-wandering points are precisely the periodic points. And so the dynamics is also asymptotically periodic. For endomorphisms, I don't really know the answer because I don't really know the answer for the free groups. And this is a more difficult question, but. I wouldn't be surprised if solving the problem for free groups also would settle this problem for these type one endomorphisms of uh, these groups. And well, type two, as I said, in this case is harder and uh, is quite more, the proof is much more involved and more technical, but we could get to basically the same thing. So again, being uniformly continuous means that U is, uh, this P is zero and this H is zero. Um, and uh, that Q is uniformly continuous. So you have at most one non-zero entry in each column and you have also at most one non-zero entry in L. Uh, and yeah, we got the same result. I, I cannot give you uh, the, the proof or even some grasp of how it goes, but yeah, it's, it's nice because these are the endomorphisms that do not come directly from endomorphisms of the free group. So I guess that if we, if the result holds, the result here is 
as good as it is in the free group, I think. If, if you can prove it for endomorphism of the free group, I think you can prove it for type one endomorphisms of this, and type two is already dealt with. So um, yeah, we get the, the same result for, for these groups as we get for, for the free group. So every non-wandering point is uh, periodic. And yeah, that's, that's uh, about it. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk, Andre. Um, does anyone have any any questions? Um, I, I unfortunately don't. Um, um, so yeah, I, I guess we should thank Andre again. Um, thank you.